Thank you to Vivian and to Mara for hosting tonight. Thank you to tonight's honoree, Judith Light, for your leadership to be so deservedly recognized in just a minute. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you too for having me and uh, most especially for caring about the work of the Empire State Pride and Gender. I share your joy in the year's successes and your determination to win tomorrow's battle. But above all, I want to say just a word or two in the time I'm allowed tonight about common cause. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, not the nation's garden spot by any means. Uh, in the 50s and the 60s, much of that time on welfare. I lived with my mother and my sister and various relatives who came and went in our grandparents' two-bedroom tenement. My mother and sister and I shared one of those bedrooms and a set of bunk beds. So you'd go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. I went to big, broken, segregated, overcrowded, sometimes violent public schools. I can't remember a time when I didn't love to read, but I don't remember actually owning my own book until 1970, when I was 14 years old, and I won a scholarship to Milton Academy, a famous old boarding school outside Boston. There are a lot of things that we didn't have in our own neighborhood, but one thing we did have was a community. Because that was a time when every child was under the jurisdiction of every single adult on the block. If you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, she'd go upside your head as if you were hers. And then call home. So you got it two times. Despite what so-called conservatives would have you think, there was a lot of emphasis on personal responsibility and hard work. But those adults also wanted us to understand. Those adults also wanted us to understand that a community is about seeing your stake in your neighbor's dreams and struggles, as well as your own. I don't remember much talk about guys or gals being out in our neighborhood. Frankly, I don't even remember talk about guys or gals being in. Our struggles seemed to be about poverty and racism. But there was a sense that social justice was a matter of common cause, that everybody had a stake in that. When I was about 10 years old, the Supreme Court struck down laws that prohibited blacks and whites from marrying. It didn't touch me directly, but I understood that that decision was rooted in the principles of fairness and equality. And that even if that decision wasn't about my present choices, it was still about me. I came to understand that just as it took a community to help me rise from the south side of Chicago to law school, to the executive ranks of Fortune 500 corporations, to the Massachusetts State House, it took a community to win equality, in that case and many more, to make America better. By the time I came to office in 2007, the Goodrich decision had been the law for three years. I was then and am now proud of the fact that Massachusetts was the first state in the nation to affirm Instead, thousands and thousands of good people, people who contribute to the well-being and vitality of our society, have been free to marry whomever they love. Just as they do in New York now, the people of Massachusetts come before their government as equals. But the waters had not yet calmed when I came to office. A constitutional amendment to ban marriage equality was brewing. That very first spring, we beat that back. The next year, I signed a bill repealing a centuries-old law, revived, by the way, by Governor Romney and others to frustrate marriage equality, that barred out-of-state couples from marrying in Massachusetts. And then we enacted legislation to grant same-sex couples the same access to Medicaid benefits as heterosexual couples enjoy. Last year, I signed legislation to extend critical protections to transgender residents seeking housing, employment, Why do we push back against small-mindedness and misconceptions? 
perceptions and hate itself. Because in a community, your struggle is my struggle, and my struggle is yours. Because as Dr. King taught us, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It's never wrong to stand for the principles that people come before their government as equals. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't, as Mark knows. I didn't realize uh, just how personal your struggle was at first. Our youngest daughter tells the story about that day in June of 2007 when lawmakers voted down once and for all the constitutional amendment banning marriage equality. A spontaneous celebration erupted outside the State House. While I stood before the crowd on the front steps thanking them for their advocacy and their support, our youngest daughter Catherine watched quietly from the crowd. She said later she felt proud of me because of how I fought so publicly for something that didn't affect me. It turned out in the end that it did. A few months later, she came out to her mom and dad. Yeah. The point is, Catherine's struggles are mine, and mine are hers. That's the way it is in a family. That's also the way it is in a community. So the question we must ask ourselves now is this. Will we be there together for the next struggle? Will you join the next fight for freedom and equality, even in another state? More than that, will you join the fight for religious freedom, for racial justice, for basic fairness in the criminal justice and immigration systems, against the kind of poverty and inequality that is crushing the urban poor and dispiriting the middle class? Will you make your neighbors' dreams and struggles your own? between two very different visions for our country. One maintains that each of us is on his or her own. It turns its back on the left out and the left back and says, in essence, in essence, I've got mine, get yours. The other recognizes our common destiny and our common cause and asks us to turn to each other rather than on each other. One and only one Community. At the Democratic National Convention last month, I told a story about the Orchard Gardens Elementary School in Boston. Thanks to an infusion of new ideas and tools and a little new money, this once chronically underperforming school is in the midst of a profound transformation. In less than a year, proficiency measures at Orchard Gardens improved 70%. The school has gone from one of the worst schools in the district to one of the best in the state. At the end of my first visit about a year and a half ago, the first grade led by a veteran teacher gathered to recite for me. First they presented a poem, sort of a pian to multicultural tolerance, and I stood and started to applause, and the teacher said, not yet, Governor. And then those first graders proceeded to recite much of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, and I was overcome, as I always am, by the soaring poetry of that sermon. And I stood to applaud again, and the teacher said, not yet, Governor. <laughs> and then she began to ask those six and seven-year-olds questions. What does creed mean? What does nullification mean? Where is Snow Mountain? And as the hand shot up to answer her questions, I realized that she had taught those little girls and boys not just to memorize, but to comprehend that speech. The part that I left out of the Orchard Garden story when I told it at the convention is this. This past February, 21st graders from Orchard Gardens arrived in Washington on what was, for most of them, their first flight on an airplane. They went to practice reciting the I Have a Dream speech one more time, this time under the towering monument honoring Dr. King on the National Mall. Later that afternoon, they, along with their bashful principal and their loving, dynamic teacher, went to the White House to recite to the President of the United States. Watching them run around the South Lawn, burning off nervous energy while they waited, 
or gawking at the unfamiliar splendor of the interiors or asking for the bathroom in, or staring in bug-eyed disbelief when President Obama walked in for diplomatic reception. They could have been any six or seven year old. Yet I'm certain that they felt important that day simply because someone made them feel worthy. It was extraordinary that that someone was the President of the United States. But what matters most is that someone made them feel worthy. That someone showed an interest in and a stake in their dreams and struggles. If we are to be a national community with common destiny and common cause, then we must see those children as our children too, yours and mine. Their struggles as our struggles. For this country to rise, they must rise. And we have a common stake in that. So I celebrate Pride Agenda and its victories for social justice in the LGBTQ community. But I also ask you to see your stake in the broader struggle, too, and to act on it. Thank you so much for having me.